we're back for another episode of Out of Band. I'm Anne. My name is Jennifer. And my name is Faith. And today we have another guest. Very, very happy to have Fortunate Bernard with us, who is a long-standing cybersecurity professional. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about him, right? Because he doesn't really need much of an introduction and he'll do a much better job of it than I will. Fortunate, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Really, really happy to be joining you. So tell us a bit about yourself. You've yes. been in InfoSec and cyber for quite some time. I think one of the very first things you told me when I first met you in a meeting was, this is not my first rodeo. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> tell us, tell us about your, all those rodeos in cyber that you've been on. Oh, but that, that, that's very interesting. Uh, been in uh, system design and architecture for a while and then discovered that I was getting bored. And uh, especially after Y2K, you know, remember Y2K? We were all excited about Y2K. Uh, and then a few years after that, I switched to security uh, and then started. And those days, it was uh, just unheard of. You didn't see many Blacks in security those days. Uh, I remember in a meeting, uh, someone asked me, how did you get that job? Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you just, uh, you realize that, oh, yeah, I shouldn't be here. It, you know, it was so niche those days. And I didn't see it as niche. I saw it as, I knew how to design a system mm -hmm. and secure it. In fact, there's no better person to secure a system than the person who designed it. So okay. it was just natural those days. And, and at those days, it was not, it was not cyber security, no. It was security. So it was just security those days, or IT security, if, if you want to be cool. Uh, and then over the years, uh, I became very quickly a leader in my, in my profession, uh, uh, in my career. Very quickly, I became a, a director, and that took me across continents and, and until where I, I am today. But very early, as a, Security architect, it was okay. But when you start climbing a ladder, as a leader in that field, mm -hmm. you start struggling to make people believe you. Okay, you won't believe it. I went to do a graduate diploma in law to add a bit of a uh, 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 legal aspect into my, my CV so that when I'm having those discussions, people can believe that I'm just not here to to tell them about these things because it was very, very difficult. And you remember those days, socks came, Saban Oxley mm -hmm. came. And, and uh, it was just not for me to be explaining to the leadership team that this is what we should be doing that. It, it, it was very, very difficult. But gradually I made my way and uh, went through challenges. I, and, and just like our industry today, I needed to be resilient. Mm -hmm. There have been times when I went back home and just said, not for me, it's just too difficult. But it was, the work was not difficult. It was the interactions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the environment, right? The environment. <clears throat> and that's where I am today. You're talking about like believability, right? So that's something that I find. And I've often wondered, you know, is it, is it because of my gender? And I'm going to ask the obvious but provocative question is, did you feel it was because you were black or because you had a technical background that you were having difficulty interacting with sort of executive leadership or a combination of both? Do you know, I think it was a combination of both. Okay. Uh, I came from a techie background mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, uh, those days, uh, yes, we talk a lot about, oh, you have 40,000 malware in your environment and the exact thing, okay, that's what I pay you for, <laughs> you know, and, but it, it was not that. I gradually, I learned very quickly the business acumen because hey, mm -hmm. when you start climbing your careers, you need to stop thinking tech and start thinking about risk and mm -hmm. the risk to the objectives of the business. Yeah. You need to adjust your language. Exactly. Yeah. You need to start thinking dollars, revenues, yeah. and how we can meet our objectives if we do things differently. And then you see struggle. So 
this guy is now talking to us about business strategy. He's not qualified to be talking about business strategy. Or should he be here? So it's always, you, you, you have that, uh, you struggle with that believability that you talk about, um, especially. Uh, and uh, I, I went through that a lot. You know, there have been times where you suffer from, uh, I suffered from that imposter syndrome. I know my staff. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. about here. Okay. I learned the business aspect so I can talk the business language, yet I'm struggling. And another thing, you climb the ladder and that's it, you don't move, you stay there. You stay there. And there the, the were a combination of few things that you just think, okay, I needed to work with you. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and you basically you climb the ladder and then you reach a point and you see that people who came after you, who you think that don't really deserve it, keep passing. Was that a situation that you found yourself in? But do you know that's what I, I used to call it? Uh, uh, I, 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 do you know in in security we have a layers, mm -hmm. okay? And I used to call it uh, layer nine, okay? And I was finding myself a lot in the layer nine. I had layer eight, layer nine, and layer ten, okay? The layer eight is uh, politics, and layer mm -hmm. nine is uh, when someone else will just pass, you know, the promotion just it just get ignored, and that's just life. And uh, yes, I was having lots of the layer nine situations where you just think, oh, okay, 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 okay. But I had another option. I didn't wait too long. When I'm in that situation and I'm struggling to move, then I just leave the organization. Now, what helped me in my career is I have hopped a lot because mm -hmm. that was the only way I could make it there. Exactly. No. And by, by hopping, you mean uh, going for a next job exactly. with, with a higher function or? Higher function, yes, higher function, okay. but in a different organization. Higher yeah. function in a different organization. Yeah. Because of the opportunity in that those organizations. So you just mm hop, -hmm. hop. And that also creates problems in your career because as you know, people don't like job hoppers. Loyalty. Yeah. They don't see it as that. The paradox, right? Which is they want the experience and with variety of companies comes experience, but then you're kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't, right? You stay too long in a place, you get slammed. You move too often, you get slammed. Very hard to find the right balance. Yeah. yeah. But hey, I look at that today. In fact, uh, anyone I'm employing, okay, because we have this, wave of digital transformation hitting the security industry today. Uh, it's difficult to find, if you get someone who's been in the same job 14, 15 years, then you think, okay, that person is not ready for digital transformation. So the <laughs> industry has now changed completely, where if you want to do digital transformation, you want someone who has hopped and done it in the various organization. So yeah. it's just, uh, yeah, we, we are going through funny times. Funny times. Changing perspectives, basically, yeah. And during, um, you know, back in the days, did you, did you feel or, yeah, did you feel that you had to try twice harder than the people around you? Do, do you know, this one, this is where I have challenged myself and a few of my friends. Is it something we have in our mind that we have to work twice hard? Okay. And up to now, in fact, I remember a, 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 a few years ago, and one of my employers told me, hey, um, we know you work too hard and we, 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 are, we are worried for your staff because you work hard. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> which is right because they're thinking, okay, if he's working that hard. I should too. Yeah, so, but it's, uh, instead of, uh, I look at that and say, yes, I was a leader and yes, I should, I, I, I know how to regulate my own environment. And I know, hey, I don't believe in work-life balance. I believe in dimensions. My work, my life has work dimension, mm -hmm. family dimension, and me dimensions. Okay, mm -hmm. and I plan it accordingly. Yeah. 
So when I'm at work, yes, I give in 120%. When I'm at home, I give in the 120%. And at the same time, I still manage sometimes to fit in the meantime, not 120%, but I don't <laughs> have okay. okay, but that was scaring even my then employers because they thought that could impact on my team, mm -hmm. the way I was working. But that's something that I have always struggled with. Why do we work so hard? Why do we always want to make sure we give in 120% without anyone questioning our devotion, our uh, uh, dedication? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I personally come from um, a high pressure environment, or at least that was the, the culture which was formative for my first full-time job. And for me, it was mostly if I don't commit to that 120%, then I will not be seen, I will not be heard, I will not be noticed, and no one will uh, reward me for the effort that I make. Um, which does ensure that you get the best out of your employees, because everyone will basically be committed to really providing that 120%. But at the same time, you are indeed pushing your employees also to a certain level, which is not always the healthiest, for, exa for example. No, absolutely. And that's something we got to be, especially as leaders, we got to be careful about, you know, uh, I always tell my those working with me or my direct report, uh, it's about what you need to do to deliver. We want, at the end of the day, we want to achieve the result for the organization. Mm -hmm. okay. You want to do it a smarter way, go ahead and do it. At the same time, I also understand that the word talent these days is overrated. Some people have grit. And with those people with grit, they may not get it always the first time. So they have to work at it hard. And you got to appreciate that too. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. whatever you need to do to get there, whether it's through sheer talent or grit, do so it. Or hard, do it. Okay. But let's not overlook people mm -hmm. just because of difference in shape, form, color, creed, race, uh, gender. No, let's not do that. Okay. And that's something, I, I, you know, we need to bring back just being human. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I, um, I got he's just so many ideas just coming to my head from what you were saying. There are so many organizations where, Jennifer, you said, for example, we're getting the best out of people, right? People working hard. Mm -hmm. For a certain period of time. I do want to add that for a certain period of time. Because either, they, either they will leave or they will be burned out. And then you also don't have anything uh, valuable anymore for them. So like if you're working, we, I, I don't know, I think we kind of correlate long hours and pushing people as giving your best. But are we giving our best when we're working in those conditions? Or, I, I don't know, it's a question. Like maybe some people do high perform under pressure. I don't, but. I don't. Yeah. Until a certain point, I would say yes. Okay. It, it's not sustainable. It's definitely uh, Yeah. Sustainable. Like you can do sprints, but it, you can't sustainably exactly. perform that way. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, just fortunately you were saying as well, right? That, um, we want to deliver results. I have a question about how many organizations, particularly in security, are clear on the result that we're looking for. Because I think that's part of the problem is that we spin wheels, right? That we're very consumed by being busy, but we're not totally sure about why we're being busy. But it, it, it's not our industry. I think it's definitely our industry where uh, hey, I'm the first one to admit that there are so many snake oil merchants in that industry, okay? Especially now that you have uh, uh, head funds managers, uh, investors in that space who are there for their big bucks, okay? And, and, and uh, we, we have we, I look at our industry, that's the industry, only industry where you have millions of products doing almost the same thing. And every year you come back and say, okay, you know what? 
I have this for you. Oh, you know what? I have this for you. But you know what is odd? Our industry is also changing the names every year. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alphabet soup of security. Every year something comes. Okay. Anti malware. Then it becomes EPP. Then it becomes EDR. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes XDR. I'm sure next year it will be ZDR. Okay. <laughs> well, they will run out of letters one at a certain moment in time. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. So you look at all this and you think poor comp companies. You know, you go to the business leaders and you tell them, okay, uh, you've just spent this money on security last year, but hey, that won't work this year. This year, now you spend that money there. Oh, by the way, this, this, you know, the buzzword today is cloud. We love cloud. We are talking about cloud. And guess what? The cloud merchants are also coming. Okay, I am native cloud, I am multi-cloud, I am hybrid cloud, oh, I do all of them. And then the poor business is thinking, do I need to buy security for all those clouds and on-prem? And we say, yes, you need to. <laughs> really? So that is our industry, you're absolutely right. And what is the result? Is I know. It keeps changing, right? The goal keeps changing every single time. If I'm okay, let me put my business hat on. What I see as a result is how do I protect my business mm -hmm. and those objectives that will make my business successful? Yeah, that's it. Do I need 100 products to do that? If I'm a pharmacist and the pharmacist give me 10 pills, I'm not going back to that pharmacist. <laughs> well, there was an article that came up yesterday, and I'd love to kind of hear you, all of your takes on this, which is, it was written um, by two researchers talking about the importance of not just protecting data as part of, you know, critical assets, saying that we really need to start reframing how we protect employees. Mm -hmm. So traditionally, we will point the finger at employees saying weakest link, fallible, dangerous, risky, et cetera, that, you know. And they were saying, no, you know, we need to reframe this entirely and say that if we made it harder for employees to become victims of phishing, et cetera, et cetera, we'd actually have much better outcomes. But that requires a complete mental shift about how much we value people and whether people are important and whether we consider that it's worth the investment. And it just sort of strikes me because I kind of came into security from a different domain, but just with an intuition that, and a belief, right, regardless of the domain, people are important. And I was just always kind of really surprised how little people seem to be present in when we talk about security, right? We have frameworks and we have um, methods, we have assets. And think about between a framework and a result, You've got behavior, like you've got people. Why do we not talk about it more? Because it's easier to sell a shiny box. Thank you. Golden, I, call it, I, call it the, I call it the golden goose. Okay, really? That, that's what's making the money. That's a golden goose. <laughs> Keeps on giving eggs. I'm sorry, we are in that industry, but that's the golden goose. If they take that away, that's it. It's a golden goose. Yeah. 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 It's sad, though, isn't it? I don't know. I mean, like, it just seems that we, are we protecting the right things? Like, because data for the data for the sake of data, data allows you to do something, right? It's sort of, I don't want my bank because I love my bank. I want my bank because it allows me to finance things that I want, buy stuff that I want. It's an enabler. And the same with data, right? The data represents an opportunity to do something in our lives that we want to do. And if it gets compromised, our ability to choose and live our lives as we want to live them gets compromised. And it just kind of, it's like the end game of where people are and why we're doing what we're doing. It's like, we're not protecting an infrastructure or a network because it's intrinsically valuable. It enables something. Um, and it enables something that people want. But, but that's really good because hey, currently, more and more people are talking about the concept of pets versus cattle, okay? And we need to develop a bit more. We need to protect the pets, okay? I live in the UK and you know how much the British love their animals, okay? If you start, 
if you don't protect your pets in the UK, in fact, your pets, you give them a name and you protect them, you feed them and you do all that. If you don't look after them, the RSPCA will come after you and everyone will treat you as animal killer. Okay, it's good. Apologies in advance to any meat eater. <laughs> the cutters. Okay. The cutters, guess what? Oh, we can slaughter them and do whatever we want there. And you don't, they have serial numbers. If you go to the, uh, uh, to the uh, slaughterhouse, they have the, the serial numbers. Okay. The data here is the pets. Everything else, especially in this ephemeral world that we are living in the cloud, those should be disposable. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to look at. Let's invest to protect the pets. As for the cattle, why are we spending millions to protect the cattle? Why? So we need to come again as industry. Are we really protecting the right thing? By yeah. then, then, if we put our business hat on as business people, we will say, let's protect the pets. If you are those investors in all those sh shining products, we tell you, oh, cattle, protect the cattle. Just protect mm -hmm. them. Why? And why don't we question that? Of course, hey, if we start doing that, I don't think we will get jobs. As <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we will get jobs. But we, I personally think as industry, we should look more at the pets and start addressing, really, should we really be changing the way we, are, we protect the cattle? Yeah. It's a good analogy. I like it. Well, sure. Jennifer, have you gone to China? You have questions. Well, it's it's. I, I I really love the way that you are looking at how to um, how uh, about your ideas about how to improve the cybersecurity industry. Because compared to you, probably I'm I'm not as long in it. I'm I'm in it for six years now, and that's actually something that I've been like walking against constantly because. Um, a lot of my colleagues, former colleagues, friends in the infosec world are really like, yeah, I've, I've, I just started working with this new tool or just started learning this new language or I just started learning this special query. And I think that is super cool. And I really believe also that you do need to keep up your technical skills if you want to succeed in this industry. But there is a pyramid, a triangle for a reason, people, processes, and technology, you can't just put one specific focus on only one area of that triangle if you want to do security properly. No, but do you know, it is, uh, I remember when I started uh, uh, security those days, uh, when I was doing my master's in information security, I think in 2002, and uh, my then lecturer told me, if you ignore one of them, you will pay. Yeah. Okay. And, and that is what is happening currently. Okay. Where I, 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 I think a couple of years ago, a friend of mine decided that, okay, let's do the cyber defense metrics, where you take the cyber defense metrics and you put your data, people, technology, process, you put all of them there and you align them to put cross in to see where mm -hmm. you are. Mm -hmm. And they realized that they have 72 tools. And guess what? They do one single annual awareness training. You know, remember the one we do once a year, click, 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 mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we all come up. In fact, some of us will have two screens and then copy, 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 copy. Oh, we pass and we get a certificate. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So they have, how do they have 72 tools, yet they have one single awareness, uh, security awareness training a year? And I bet you hundred dollars if the poor user click on a phishing link there, he or she is probably matched to the manager. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. are, you know, you look at that and just think it is not right. No, no, absolutely not. And something that is also quite interesting is if you are talking about, for example, security awareness, that um, usually it's one type of training which does get translated to different languages but it's usually just one type of training it isn't localized so it doesn't speak to how different people races whatever you however you want to call it uh, interpret information or absorb it and 
that basically also kind of impacts how people learn, how people are able to defend themselves and how people are able to recognize cybersecurity uh, dangers. But, but, but you, that, that's a very good point. I like, I, I, that really resonates with me. We put something out there and we think it fits everything. Again, it comes down to what we're talking about, okay? Yes, it may fit 80% of the population, but what about- The 20%, yeah. What about the 20% that we just think, okay, they, they will just fit in. They will just fit in. Why? Why should they just fit in? Mm -mm. Because majority is rural. And it's expensive to tailor. I'm just wondering though, like, is it really hitting the 80%? Sometimes it just seems that we're tailoring and it's actually the other way around, right? That we're privileging the 20% and there's 80% people who are just kind of find themselves out of scope. Yeah. And that's something that I'm thinking that we, 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 we also need to look at the way we create those security awareness or programs for, for the rest of the organization. Uh, and again, you got to look, it, it, there is an element of diversity and inclusion here as well, which I don't think people always take into consideration. Okay, they don't always take that into consideration. And uh, I had a, a few years ago, uh, I had a candidate and on CV, fantastic, really good. And then uh, someone at, uh, in the HR team called me and said, hey, listen, you may want to take his call. So no, no, just arrange him, just, just arrange it, come to the interview and we just, no, you really want to take this call. Okay, and I pick up the call. And he was blind. Yes, blind. I had a discussion with the guy on the phone and I thought, wow, mm -hmm. on earth did he achieve this? Mm -hmm. How on earth? And, and, and when you look at things like that, that really sets you, you just, okay. You know, we talk a lot about inclusion, but when you look at situations like that, you just thought, right, we really need to reset the way we think. Mm -hmm. it's yeah. a diversity of thought, diversity of mind, diversity of approach, every single thing in our industry. And by the way, looking at the way, hey, I look at our industry today, by the way, it is more diverse than ever, okay? Nothing that I've ever seen. Yes, but there's still a lot we could do in that space. There are still improvement points, definitely. So you were saying, right, when you started out that you had that feeling, should I be here, right? Are there, you know, if you look around, it's a caricature, but are there more people like you? Or has it changed? Strange enough, that hasn't changed much. Yes, there are more now, but not much. Okay. And, and that's something that I, I see it as very disappointing. Okay. Uh, yes, there are more, but I just, especially in the UK, I still feel is a road less traveled by the Blacks, okay? I'll give you an example. I'll give you this start, and this always hurts. When you look at the big falls. Oh. Mm. Look at you. <laughs> Jennifer, hi, I'm okay. looking at you. Ex big four. <laughs> okay. Don't say anything, okay? Mm -hmm. There were, and the start I got were a few years ago. There were three, thousand partners in the UK. Out of those, only 11 yeah. were blacks. Guess how many of those blacks were in cyber? Zero. One. One. Out of 3,000 partners? Really? So if you don't get that sorted, how many apprentices and graduates are you going to bring in that sector? You can't be what you can't see. It can't be what you can't see. Exactly. Unfortunately, it is still, hey, we all want to be with the big force. I was with big four in my past and we all want to be there. Okay. But 
and, and, and I feel is a huge entry point, a huge missed opportunities here. Okay. Is an industry, I, I just can't understand. At the same time, I'm partially responsible for some of those because I look at, okay, now looking at my mentees, yes, I'm getting minorities as, as mentees, but before it was mostly- Difficult. Yes, yeah. very difficult. And, you know, I look at, I live in London and I'm just thinking, why is no one approaching those universities and say, okay, hey guy, people like me going to the university and talking to them and say, okay, hey, this industry, this industry is there for you. The, you, you, you it helps. Let's face it. When you look at, in terms of uh, wealth, mm -hmm. black are still at the bottom. Okay, of let's course. face it. But this is an opportunity to start elevating ourselves because cyber security does pay. Let's face it, it does pay. Okay, okay, we, they, they pay well. And I look at that. That could start helping our people. So why don't we go to universities like that and, and, and just talk to them? Why don't we approach the communities? Why don't we go in more and talk about mentoring and talk about the big force, mm -hmm. create those opportunities? And of course, those big companies don't at the top, okay? Mm -hmm. Start, how do we help them to start dragging those people and say, okay, this is an industry. And guess what? We're talking about digital transformation now. Mm -hmm. There is no digital transformation without security, without cyber security is going to be there for generations. So why are we not encouraging our people to jump in? I had, I did a career talk for um, a group of, I'd say they're like 15, 16 year olds. It's like uh, high school and it's not a poor area of Paris, but it's definitely not one of the posh areas. And there were like four or five of us from the company where we work and talking about different things and I could see that like we were doing it remotely right so I wasn't in the room it's always a little bit more difficult but I could see that they weren't really listening right okay they're teenagers whatever but they like even for teenagers they weren't really listening and I just kind of went okay listen I'm not here to bore you okay so if I'm if I'm saying something that you're just not getting let's have a chat and they looked a bit uncomfortable and one of the the, the more outgoing ones just said, Madame, it, it's like nothing against you, but you're talking about jobs. People from around here don't do those kind of jobs. Ouch. So how? Wow. And these, like, it, they were all colors, right? Oh, they're all French, but there were some black kids. There were people who had, I think, um, parents from North Africa, from Sub Saharan Africa. There were Asians. There was like all kinds of everybody, but it was. People like us from around here don't do those kind of jobs. And I was like, going, hang on a second. What do you mean people like you? And we spent 40 minutes talking about that. I said, what do you think I am? And they, I was there, I'm, I don't come from a very wealthy family. I'm Irish in France. I've been a stay-at-home mom. I've worked in banking. I've, like, I've been in different things, but what, what is it that you think I am? And when they'd heard that I'd been like a stay-at-home parent for a decade, they kind of went, oh, wow. So like, you were like our mom. And I was like, yeah. And it just was kind of tragic to me that they had shut doors or believed that doors were shut before they'd even left school. I guess it's, um, so we just tend to limit ourselves, right? Exactly, but how on earth did we get, how did we create that? How, how do we put that on ourselves, believing that that's not for us or we can't make it, okay? In fact, we're not talking about a glass ceiling, we're talking about a con concrete ceiling here. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just like, like, I could see their eyes kind of going, what, you mean we, we could apply? And I was like, yeah. And I said, you don't, have to, you don't have to go to one of the elite schools, right? What matters is that you're able to do stuff and you can go and get an education and it doesn't matter. Okay, so in France, yes, the, there are countries in France is one of them where the stamp of approval from an elite education uh, institution, same like in the US, Ivy League, yeah. But still, but, uh, no, 
no offense, but I think one of the, the, the most awesome things about working in cybersecurity, working in InfoSec, is that there is also a hell of a lot of free content available, which is something that can be done by so many people if they only have access to a computer and internet. And that they know and are encouraged. I think maybe that's sort of the point. Yeah, the thing I, th I, I think the thing is, um, do they know that they exist? They know, right? Yeah, that's the thing. Because... Because if you if you're raised in let's say a privileged family, you have internet every day, right? So you grow up knowing that there is internet. In you, you get to know what courses are there very easily. But if you do not have that, yeah. you won't even know, right? And and we have companies, for example, that keep going to schools, right? But they go to A schools. Why are they not going to schools that are in dingy places yeah. if if they if we change how you know uh, how we think about those types of schools then maybe we will be able to reach out to a wider or a diverse um group of people mm -hmm. it's just it's not because you get born into poor surroundings that you have any less potential I and it just that that I don't know it 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 really made me sad actually just being with those kids because like we we had a great conversation and I could see that some of them were oh wow okay they had a changed perspective but I was like God like how many of them are there that are thinking that but it's um, it won't be easy okay it won't be easy. Uh, I, I personally believe, having gone through this industry for a while, that uh, inclusion and diversity will be, is helping with innovation and productivity. I see it every single day. And I know it won't be easy, and uh, it, will, it, it needs hard work, regardless of uh, race or gender. But what I think is, I talked before about stone at the top. Mm -hmm. How do we get those company leaders to start tying their fantastic bonuses to inclusion? Okay. Needs to be an incentive. Yeah, in, there needs to be an incentive. Clearly. Or a law. Or a law. <laughs> like it actually gets mandated. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so the people. Uh, uh, these kids can see that there is a future here. There is an opportunity here to elevate ourselves from that poverty line that they talk about. Okay, there is opportunity here. Okay, uh, and, and that's something that I'm seriously looking at. Recently, uh, uh, working with uh, the ICMCP in the US, which is the International Community for minority cybersecurity professionals. Mm -hmm. And I'm setting up a chapter in the UK, something that I'm doing. One of the reasons why I'm setting that is, I look at this award, I get invited to lots of awards. You know, in fact, apart from the Oscars and the Golden Globe, the security industry is also giving, we love giving each other awards, yes. don't we? we love that, okay. But something I don't really, I don't get, is how come I just don't get any of those awards? Or <laughs> the awards don't look like me. So I decided to set up my own awards. <laughs> <laughs> Good way to get to it. <laughs> yeah, I just thought, okay, so working with the ICMCP, we start looking at that and just so that, okay, that's another thing. The security industry offering our awards, everything, a black hat, this black hat do before the pandemic, we had all of them. But I don't see black CISO win awards. Mm -hmm. I don't see that. And I'm just thinking, okay, gosh, oh, CISO of the year. And you look around, it's another one. And I just think, <laughs> So he's been doing that work for the last 45 years. <laughs> he doesn't have any innovation, yet he's real. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, that's something that we need to, but it does demand work. Uh, more and more companies I'm seeing are doing something in that space internally. But I think we now need to do community outreach. We yeah. need to go to those communities. We need to go to those schools, those universities and talk to them and say, hey, listen, there is an opportunity here. Oh. And by the way, this word is becoming more as a code. The cooker is talking to me. The oven is talking to me. I run out of milk, the fridge will test me to let me know. <laughs> That's scary. 
Okay. And uh, that we need to bring these kids and say, okay, by the time you are 18, you won't even you don't need it, you won't need a driving license. Yeah. Okay. I will drive you. Yeah. Exactly. So we need to look at how we take these kids on the journey. How and that's what I believe is mentoring, opportunity, community outreach, but also try to find a way to tie their fantastic bonuses and say, okay, what have you done? Yeah, accountability. Mm -hmm. Right. There's nothing that we're gonna change if there's no one who's accountable. Yeah, because it's like you've got you've got people like you, fortunate, right? Energy, belief, and you sort of, you know, we can all change stuff at our level, but what we're talking about is the need for change at scale. And that's that's where the accountability comes in, right? Yeah. And there's and there's little there's little that we can do, or there's little that I can do at my level. There needs to be people at a higher level that change stuff. But we can make noise at our level. We can make noise. <laughs> I keep making noise. <laughs> I mean, there there is stuff that we can do at our level. Yeah. Um, definitely, for example, showcasing ourselves, our work, and also um, what can be achieved, for example, at this age. <laughs> Bless you. Apologies. Thank you. Um, but indeed, upper level uh, should just help. Step up, yeah. Cool. <laughs> so we are all out of time for today because we, this could go on for hours and hours and hours. Cool. Yes, absolutely. Great. It was a really, really great conversation. So it's, um, yeah, a shout out to the leaders who have, you know, values and a desire to make things better. Um, we're counting on you to get behind the grassroots volunteers and actually and actually help mm -hmm. do yeah. these things at scale and pace. Actually, it's not just scale; it needs velocity behind it. Yeah. yeah. And also a shout out to groups like Share the Mic in Cyber, right? ICM. ICM is it ICM CMCP? ICM yeah. The ones that try to promote diversity, try to um, make it possible for those that cannot afford to get the knowledge or the skills by themselves, they actually play, pay for um, the trainings for Black people so that they can be competitive in the industry. So yeah. shout yeah. out to them. <laughs> oh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. And uh, uh, as we are coming to an end, there's something I always forget when I do these things. All the views here are my views. It does not represent the views of my employer. So that's making yeah. sure we say that you don't want the lawyers on my case. Disclaimer that's here. Your personal opinions. <laughs> personal opinions. And okay, but I, I think it's fantastic. Uh, uh, great opinions, what did you say? I said they're great opinions, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer, want to wrap up? Yeah, sure. So again, Fortune, thank you so much that you wanted to join us today. Um, I know I absolutely enjoyed the conversation and I hope um, the other ladies as well. Um, that being said, um, we're at it again. Um, for our viewers, please like and subscribe, share this because I think that this is absolutely a conversation worth sharing. And uh, yeah, we will make sure that we will link also the initiatives that we mentioned during this podcast. And uh, thank you so much. See you next time. Thank Ciao. you. Bye-bye.